Today we continue on with our NHL season preview series. We're taking a look at the Edmonton Oilers. Can they get over another playoff disappointment and take some steps forward? This team made a lot of changes this offseason. Did they make the right moves? We'll discuss the, what their expectations are for them coming up next. Welcome back to another video here, Top Shelf Hockey. Now, as I mentioned today, we're continuing on our NHL season previews. We're looking now at to the West Coast and to the Edmonton Oilers. The Oilers obviously will go back to competing in the Pacific Division after competing in last year's North Division. And of course, their team has gone through quite a few changes after another disappointing playoff performance. So today, we're going to recap what happened last year, take a look at who their leaders were, and then we're going to take a look at all the changes, the exits, the additions, and then we're going to look at their projected lineup and what I think they will do this upcoming year for, uh, you know, how they will perform. Now, first up, let's take a look at last year's result. Of course, last year, the Oilers ended up competing in the newly formed North Division. Of course, due to the pandemic, the NHL had to play a shortened season of 56 games. All teams only played divisional games only, and we had different divisions, uh, so they could only play regionally based games. Of course, all the Canadian teams played in one division as the North where the Oilers finished in second place with a record of 35-19-2 for 72 points. Now, they had some pretty good overall results. Uh, they only finished behind Toronto in the division. Uh, they ended up with goals four of 183, which was the seventh best in the league. They were pretty good in goals against at 154 for ninth best. Uh, their power play was phenomenal at 27.5%, and the PK was pretty solid too at 82.4. So really, looking at all things here, they had a pretty solid regular season. But what happened when they went into the playoffs? They didn't win one single game. They lost four straight games to the Winnipeg Jets in the opening round. Uh, where they were in the two versus three series. Of course, Toronto and Montreal played in the four versus one series. And uh, the Jets went on to sweep them, uh, which was quite surprising. Of course, the Jets then went on to be swept themselves. It was kind of an odd paradox that we don't really see happen very often in the NHL playoffs, but uh, that's two years in a row that the Oilers had a disappointing results. Of course, the year before, going into the bubble, they lost a play-in series against the Chicago Blackhawks. They came a little bit closer to winning. At least they had more goals and a few wins, but not enough to get the job done to advance on and officially be in the opening round at that point of the Stanley Cup playoffs. So now, hopefully this year, we're going to have an 82-game season. At least that's the plan. Uh, we should be able to get back to normal, hopefully. And hopefully the Oilers can back to winning and having a little bit more playoff success. Uh, I know Connor McDavid appears to be getting a little frustrated. We'll talk about that, too, a little bit in a few moments' time. Now, of course, let's take a quick look at their individual leaders last year. No big surprise. Connor McDavid led the way and leading in all categories with 33 goals and 72 assists for 105 points. Absolutely incredible considering the shortened season that we had of only 56 games. Of course, Leon Dreisaitl. Uh, number two uh, in most of those categories, actually in all three, uh, with 31 goals, 55 assists for 85 points. I make that 53 assists, sorry. Uh, so obviously, uh, dry settle with another phenomenal year. Of course, only outpaced by McDavid, who was just on an absolute tear last year. It was insane what he accomplished. And Tyson Berry, the newly acquired uh, free agent defenseman, really took over that back end and the offense back there and really Got a little bit back to normal for himself, being able to drive more play, uh, scoring eight goals and 40 assists for 48 points. Uh, so certainly it's been a good fit. He ends up re-signing there as well. Uh, so, of course, the Edmonton Oilers had some, uh, you know, a lot of decisions to make. They made a lot of decisions with players going out, players coming in. And obviously some key names as well that, that did re-sign, like Tyson Berry, like to get Ryan Nugent Hopkins done on a long-term deal, just over $5 million, uh, you know, on a long-term deal, which is important to keep him in the mix. Basically, until near the end of his career, he likely will retire at Edmonton Oiler now at this point. At least that's what it seems. Um, you know, and but others did not uh, make that cut, and some had to leave, some were traded. And let's take a look at how this team has changed. Like I said, after back-to-back -back playoff failures, you knew Ken Holland was going to be looking to shake things up here a little bit and see if they could change the supporting cast around McDavid and Dreisel. I know one of the key themes to their offseason was bringing in leadership. It seemed like they were lacking a little bit of experience and leadership around uh, you know, this team when it comes to the big games, and that was certainly something they wanted to add. And actually another contract too that I didn't mention that was a huge signing, which was probably fair to say a bit of an overpayment, was Darnell Nurse getting an absolutely 
ridiculous, insane eight-year deal as well. He's a top defenseman, plays a ton of minutes, a huge piece for them. But I do think they, you know, they did have to overpay a little bit to get that deal done. I just hope the deal works out for them here longer term. But looking at the players now that didn't make that cut, an excellent franchise will include Alex Chase on. Now at this point, it is remotely possible, and I say remote, that he could still come back because he hasn't signed anywhere. Is he still a free agent? Maybe he gets a PTO. I'm not sure, but he's been kind of kicking around Edmonton now for a few years. I'm not really sure what his future holds. Last year was not overly great for Alex Chason. Uh, Dominic Cahoon, uh, that experiment did not work out. I thought he might find some chemistry with fellow countryman uh, Leon Dreisaitl. That didn't really work out, uh, and he's no longer there. Of course, they bought out James Neal, uh, and he hasn't signed anywhere. So Neal's finally uh, done with the Oilers. Uh, that contract he signed with the Flames didn't work out. Got swapped in, uh, to Edmonton for Lucic, and uh, the Lucic part of it in Calgary has probably worked out a little bit better. Not so much money-wise, but at least just finding a, a, a way to stay in the lineup and be uh, more of a contributor, I guess. But Neil is gone. Uh, and then you've got Juju Arcara left via free agency, goes to Chicago. Adam Larson ended up being the pick to go to Seattle. Uh, he signed there as a free agent, but uh, of course, uh, where he signed there during the uh, early window when they were allowed to speak to them, that counted as the Oilers' selection to Seattle, uh, which was a big shock to many. A lot of people thought Larson was going to re sign. And it appears as though that contract never got done just because he did look like he wanted a, a new scenery is what it looked like there. Uh, Tyler Ennis has not signed anywhere, but I believe he it looks like he's going to Vancouver in a PTO. We don't know that 100% as of the recording of this video, at least. So we'll see where he goes. But does it look like he's going back to Edmonton? Of course, Ethan Bear was traded to Carolina uh, in a, a trade for Warren Fogle. We also had a situation where they traded Caleb Jones to Chicago, bringing in another big-name defenseman going back the other way, which we'll talk about those guys on the addition segment here coming right up. Uh, lots of change. Those two young defensemen, and Jones and um, Bear, were both guys that they've developed a long time. I'm kind of surprised they both vacate the uh, the organization the same year, uh, you know, in return for some veterans coming in. But we'll see. They do have a lot of uh, young prospect defensemen looking to wake their way into the lineup here as well. Uh, you also have guys like uh, Kulikov, uh, who was brought in at the deadline and did not return, as well as Gaetan Haas, as well, who signs over in Europe. So they had a lot of players vacate. Now, who are the new bodies coming in to be members of the Edmonton Oilers this year? Uh, they certainly brought in some quality players, uh, some quality people, and I think the leadership and hard work aspect that they were looking to um, you know, really get more of in the organization certainly was accomplished, but you have to wonder how this is all going to work out. Of course, they get Zach Hyman from the Leafs on a long-term deal. I really like Zach Hyman's play. I think he'll be a good winger, probably for Connor McDavid or Dry Settle. I'm not sure where they'll place him, but he'll play a top six role, and he'll fit in like he did with Matthews and Marner, I'm sure. Um, but obviously, Hyman's a hardworking guy who can contribute offensively, uh, can you know battle in the corners, uh, be a little bit stronger defensively than some wingers too. So he'll be a good addition. I do think they probably paid more than on, uh, many of us expected them to to get, to get his services. So I uh, certainly hope that works out. But great player. Not sure I, I like the money, but we'll see how that works out. Uh, Duncan Keith comes over from Chicago in that Caleb Jones trade. Um, Duncan Keith is one of the greatest Blackhawk defensemen. I really like Duncan Keith. I have a lot of respect for him. Uh, but at the same time, he's he's getting a little bit past his prime. It's definitely fair to say that uh, his prime has been a, a while since he's been in it. And at this point, um, I'm not sure that he makes them better. Now, does he bring a lot of experience? Yes. Does he bring Stanley Cup championships to his resume? Absolutely, he does. Does he know how to win? And can he show these guys how to be a good pro and certainly uh, help them learn stuff? Absolutely, he can. But can he play a top four role and be a key contributor and be, due to the money he's making and the spot in the lineup they're going to give him? I certainly hope so, but I do have my concerns that he can. Obviously, that's the big thing. Now, I know in Chicago, they relied on him way too much. Uh, which is certainly part of the reason why his numbers weren't as great as they could have been. Uh, maybe the, the hope is, at least in Edmonton, he can play a lower, smaller role and maybe kind of you know offset and that will help him be a little bit better. We'll see. I, I just uh, said I really like Duncan Keith. I, I, I feel bad critiquing him, but I'm just not sure he still has it in him to play a top four role for the kind of minutes they need and to be able to contribute the way that his paycheck expects him to so we'll see how that works out I, I hope it works out but i have concerns obviously Derek ryan comes in as a number three center uh you know obviously a responsible two-way guy 
I can take faceoffs, kill penalties, something they were hoping Kyle Turris could do, but has not done effectively. So Ryan comes in as a potential replacement. Of course, Turris is still in the organization as well. Uh, they did sign Brendan Perlini, a former first-round pick in the NHL, bounced around to a few teams, played last year in Europe, comes back for another shot at the NHL with Edmonton. So we'll see if he can crack a spot in their lineup here uh, as a winger. Uh, you also got Warren Fogle, as I mentioned, to come over from Carolina for Ethan Bear. Uh, Fogle looking for a fresh start as well. Should be able to provide some secondary scoring. And then you got Cody CC signs as a free agent as well. After actually, I must say, uh, he, he did well in Pittsburgh. Uh, better than I thought he would do. And I'm a little bit surprised in a way that they didn't retain him. But I guess the money that Edmonton was offering was probably just more than Pittsburgh was willing to spend. And uh, there we go. So, I mean, to me, Cody CC should be a good fit back there. But... I don't know. I, I've always had some uh, likes and dislikes when it comes to Cody's game. Uh, there's some things, uh, you know, when he was younger that looked like he was going to be more offensive. Now he often gets thrust into the shutdown kind of role. And I know some some stats indicate that he's better at it than pe people think. But I don't know. I just I do have concerns over the Oilers' blue line. Uh, like I said, they're going to have... Uh, Tyson Berry, they're going to have Duncan Keith, they're going to have Cody Ceci back there, and they're all well-respected for certain parts of their game. They've had decent careers, but I just, just not a lot of defense there, in my opinion. So we'll have to see how that all works out. But at the end of the day, the Oilers are certainly going to be a different-looking team. That much we know for certain. Now, before we look at the lineups and give my predictions, I want to pause for a moment and acknowledge one of our channel sponsors, Exter Smart Wallet. Top Shelf Hockey is proud to be sponsored by Exter. Forbes calls Exter the most successful smart wallet brand in the world. They certainly have high quality products, high grade leather. You can put all your cards in your wallet with RFID protection and you can track it worldwide. That's the best part. You don't have to worry about losing your wallet and not being able to track it down. They have a great selection of products to choose from here, a variety of colors and styles something to surely help for everyone as you can see in the demonstration here for the product i have this is a beautiful packaging high quality when you open it up you get a high quality wallet with lots of slots for your cards you have yourself a money clip if you want to carry cash on you here as well uh, and certainly as you can see the quality is outstanding and here you can see the switch where you can help open up your cards you just one little click and boom everything fans out right in front of you easy to access your cards are protected and here's the back where you have yet another slot. A terrific overall product, and I can't recommend these enough. Extra ships worldwide, and you can check out the link down below in the description as well as the pinned comment to buy yours today. So thanks very much for watching that promotional content. I greatly appreciate it. If you're interested in checking out their products further or making a purchase, which I would highly recommend you do. They're great, high-quality wallets, and you'll never have to worry about losing them if you have one of their trackers, which uh, helps you keep it, especially if you lose stuff, which I know happens to me once in a while. There is a link down below in the pinned comment where you can click on and take you directly there to check out what they have to offer. Now, back to the Oilers. Let's take a look at the uh, line combinations on the depth charts from dailyfaceoff.com. Now, keep in mind, this may not be exactly how the Oilers lineup goes. For at this point in the year, these lineups are put together based on player ratings. Uh, so they're kind of rated on position and just basically like a depth chart. So it doesn't mean they're going to play exactly like this. But essentially, your first line likely going to be Connor McDavid, Jesse Pugliarvi, and Zach Hyman. That's a real good possibility we're going to see that. Uh, line two very well could be Dreisaitl, Yamamoto, and Ryan Nugent Hopkins. But of course, you have to get Yamamoto signed. And they don't have a ton of, they don't have very much cap space to do that. That's going to be complicated. He's going to more than likely have no choice but to take a one or two year deal uh, at fairly cheap money. I mean, I think they're at this point the Oilers like Yamamoto, but they're not 100% convinced that he is a top six winger, uh, at least on a consistent basis. I think he, they're still trying to figure out what he is to determine how he gets paid. Does he get a long term deal, short term deal? And I, I just don't know that he gets the longer-term deal. I don't think they can really afford it anyway right now. So we'll see how that goes. Hopefully he gets signed before camp. Uh, line three very well could be Ryan McLeod, Josh Archibald, and Warren Fogle. But I think the reason they brought in a guy like Derek Ryan and they still have Kyle Turris there is they're not 100% convinced. We'll see what training camp brings us that Ryan McLeod is capable of taking on that role. Now, I think they'll be quite happy if he is. Um, but we'll see how that goes. And we could see a fourth line of uh, Derek Ryan, 
Zach Cassian, possibly Devin Shoreland. Like I said, you still have the veteran like Kyle Turris there trying to get into the mix as well. Tyler Benson, another uh, young winger, trying to get some more playing time too. So we'll see where they go with this. I mean, obviously the Oilers are going to have options. They have a lot of uh, cheaper contracts when it comes to the wing to try to figure out who fits where. And uh, they're going to have to find their, their set lineup here. And I wouldn't be surprised if it's a little bit different than what this currently shows. Now on the blue line, uh, you're going to have Darnell Nurse and Tyson Berry. Uh, you have Duncan Keith and Cody Cece. And then, of course, you have Chris Russell and possibly Evan Bouchard, but you still have Slater Cuckoo in the mix as well. I'm not 100% convinced that Evan Bouchard is going to win a regular spot and be like a number five or six guy where he plays every game. I do see him getting more NHL opportunity this year um, and likely, you know, getting in there more often than not. But I think he may have to start as a number seven to get his spots when he's able to impress the staff and see if he can get in there on a more regular basis. I know Slater Cuckoo actually played pretty well last year before he got hurt, so uh, I think we might see a situation where they go with the, the veterans of Russell and Cuckoo um, over Bouchard. Now, Russell's expiring on an expiring contract uh, after this year. Uh, Cuckoo, I believe, only signed a one-year deal as well, so like ultimately some of these younger guys like Bouchard and Broberg uh, might get more opportunity as early as next year. We'll have to see, but at the end of the day, and there's always injuries in the mix, too. So we'll have to see where things go. Of course, in goal, we have the same tandem, which is very surprising. We got Mike Smith and Miko Koskinen. Uh, I find it hard to believe that Koskinen is back with the team, but he here we are. He is. Uh, Mike Smith had an awesome year last year. I have no uh, concerns, but, but uh, really, but my big concern is can he go into 82 game season and keep up that play from last year? What if he gets hurt? He's getting, you know, older like everybody else is, but, you know, he's. He's no spring chicken. Like, if he gets hurt, they just can't have Koskinen be in a situation where he has to uh, take the ball and run with it for an extended time. They'll be completely, um, you know, screwed, really, in my opinion. So, ultimately, they need Mike Smith to stay healthy. And I'm just really surprised they don't have or didn't find a way to move on from Koskinen and bring in another goalie that's more reliable as a backup to spell Smith and get more playing time and just be a look said more steady should he have any extended time away due to injuries or anything of that nature. So we will see what happens. But as far as what I'm projecting for the Oilers this year, uh, I think I have them finishing around second place in the Pacific. I think the one team in their division that will be tough to beat will be the Vegas Golden Knights. Uh, so I do see the Oilers making the playoffs. I see all their top guys dominating as usual. I think the blue line will be offensively gifted this year. Uh, I have some concerns over their actual defensive play. Hopefully Cody CC uh, works out for them uh, and Duncan Keith. I mean, that's my... My real concern there, I mean, you know, at least with Nurse and Barry, you know what they are. Cuckoo and Russell, you know what they are. Uh, CeCe and, and Keith as a pair, if they end up playing together, we don't really know. And I have concerns about each, so I don't, you know, I'm just not sure defensively they're going to be really be as good that way. And when it comes to the overall forward group, to me, they're going to be probably about the same, if not slightly better than last year. And goaltending, while you hope it holds up, and Mike Smith, can duplicate what he did last year. That's why I say I think they're going to be a good team. It's hard to predict playoff success right now for this team just by the way they're built. I mean, I do think they'll be a good team and uh, we'll hopefully be able to get at least a round or two in in the playoffs, but it's hard to say. I think I need to see a little bit more of all these changes to really see how everything shakes out. But I think in a weaker Pacific Division, uh, they should be able to get up in the top couple spots. So let me know what your feelings are on the Edmonton Oilers upcoming season. Do you like the moves they've made this offseason? Or did Ken Holland uh, bring in too much uh, veterans and maybe there's not enough uh, skill and speed in this lineup now? It's hard to say because it's a very different looking Oilers team compared to last year. Let me know your thoughts down in the comments. We'll discuss further. If you're new to this channel, make sure you subscribe and stick around. We will keep you up to date with all the latest news, rumors, and analysis on all 32 NHL teams. Thank you for watching, and I will catch you next time.